goofy historians is the funnest place to learn about history? Or is it the funniest? Can I uh, interview you? Or you? Or uh, you? Or you? Or maybe you guys. How about you? Hi, this is Joseph Whitmore, one of the goofy historians, not necessarily the goofiest, but certainly one of them. Uh, we're, what we're going to do is we're going to do a series of, of, of uh, shows on St. Peter's Basilica, specifically the one we know today, the one you can go see in Rome. But what I'd like to do in this one is sort of a preload, pre-preface to that, a prelude to that, right? It's like, why, how did this building uh, why did it start, you know, and what's its background up to the point where Pope Julius II comes in and says, let's build a new basilica to St. Peter. It's not like there wasn't one there before, right? As a matter of fact, there was one there that was built by Constantine like 1,300 years ago. So this is just a little bit of how we got to that. So 10, 15 minutes, I'm gonna go through some 1,300 years of history, 1,500 years of history, maybe getting up to uh, Pope Julius. So basically what happened, uh, Jesus comes down to save everybody and then he dies. But before he dies, he says he's gonna make Peter his, 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 his rock, right? It was a foundation, right? Uh, you know, again, if I was Jesus, Peter wouldn't have been the guy I selected, right? But, you know, again, I'm not Jesus. He selected Peter. Um, and Peter, he says, Peter, you are Peter, or Simon, you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. Petra is rock in Greek, but Peter didn't speak Greek. So probably the, you know, the nuance was, was, was over his head. Um, but when that happened, you know, Jesus, you know, they went out and they sort of spread the word and the Christian early Christians were, you know, usually under the radar, but one time Nero burnt down Rome so he could open up some real estate and he blamed it on the Christians, right? Not, so they weren't being persecuted for being Christians, they were persecuted for, for starting a fire. Um, but it, indeed, you know, like the Romans, sense of entertainment was 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 not um uh you know they, they didn't have netflix or amazon right or you know disney plus right they 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 uh they built a coliseum and they like to see people eaten by animals most of the time these were slaves taken in battle but you know, they throw in a few Christians, and so Christians were could be persecuted during that time. Uh, but they were far from the only ones being persecuted, right? And sometimes you get the sense when you read Christian propaganda, it seems like Christians are the only one being per persecuted. But at that time, you know, Christians were mostly not from the upper classes. They were women and slaves, grave diggers. Uh, because at that time, Rome was bringing slaves and hordes of, you know, captured people into Rome, right? And this is a very hierarchical society. So these people had no say, right? So Christianity offered, you know, I would have become a Christian, right? I mean, Roman law gave you no rights, right? But in this Christian religion, you could become a direct, direct, you had, you had paradise to look forward to. You had a direct relationship with God. Uh, as opposed to Zeus, right? You had no relationship with him. Um, so it was a good thing, you know, but at that time, you know, the, the, it was following more of the precepts of, of that Christ set down of turn, turn the other cheek, you know, love your enemy. Uh, the put Christians in the lion dims. They didn't bring their M17 along with them or their, their AR-17s or their Kalashnikovs. You know, they, they didn't fight back. They were peaceful. Um, their symbols were, you know, the fish, the lamb, the dove, you know, peaceful, you know, animals, you know, prey animals. Almost. I mean, uh, yeah, prey animals, are, you know, are symbols that were preyed upon by everybody else. They, they, they considered themselves not part of this world. But in 315, right, we're almost having a hard time. Uh, there was split between the East and the West and things were going on. And... Uh, apparently God wasn't happy with that. So there was a man called Constantine and God told 
Constantine to basically beat the shit out of all of his enemies, right? And take over the Roman Empire. And he says, and he put the sign in the sky saying, in this sign, you will conquer, right? So no more turning the other cheek. This was a militant Christianity. And so he took over, you know, he, he actually won, right? And he, and he, his, his, the, um, the person he was competing with for to be the Roman Empire, uh, Extantius, I think, he, you know, he cut off his head, put it on a pole, paraded it around Rome, you know, when he went to, you know, Maxentius's, you know, villa where he was living at in Rome when he was pretending to be the, the, the emperor. And he built St. Peter's Basilica, right? That was about 315. And he said, this is the church. And he, this was supposedly where Peter had been crucified, right? Upside down, you know, in this spot. And they built this church. Uh, and at that, that time, you know, the, you, you would think that, you know, I, I don't know, Constantine thought he could unite the empire if it became Christian. Um, it didn't work. You know, it actually fell all together within 100 years of Constantine. It started to fall in 475. It actually did fall. And the barbarian hordes, hordes came, the, the Goths, the Vandals, the Huns, the Magyars came, uh, and Rome fell. And when Rome fell, right, all the maintenance that was going into the Roman Empire ceased to exist. And everybody, like, were worried about their own survival. So they built walls, right? They started building walls in little cities. Before that, you know, there were no walls. People didn't need to build walls because everybody was part of the Roman Empire. Right? There was no walls. Walls only came into being when the empire started to fall apart. But when Rome... At the end, Rome had a wall because it was being attacked. But at that point, there was a million, you know, at the time of Constantine or just before, there were a million people living in Rome. But after Rome fell and the infrastructure that went along with Rome, with Rome, right, the population got smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller until the time of Julius, there was maybe 20,000 people living in Rome, right? It was a very small fraction, right? Most of Rome, there were you know, they'd gone back over to, um, you know, farmland or forest or wild. There were, there were wolves, you know, everything it was a very small part. And all the aqueducts have, had long since disappeared. So people were drinking out of the Tiber. Uh, and of course, there was a little maintenance done on St. Peter's, right? Uh, the popes still lived there, right? So there was some, you know, you had the popes who, who, who had gotten a lot of worldly power as opposed to just, just spiritual power. They, they were also had military power and they, they had a part of Italy, like the middle part of Italy, they called the Papal States that they actually controlled as part of an earthly kingdom they controlled, right? And they had to control it. So they had to like go to war against other Catholics in order to maintain their little thing, their little empire of, in Italy. But at one point, you know, a French man became Pope and he decided that he didn't want to live in Rome because it was small and dirty and crumbling at the seams. So it was about 1300. So he moved the papacy to France, right? Right during the Hundred Years' War, where there was a, a war between England and France, right? So, and France was winning always when, you know, the popes were French, living in France, right? So and figure that out. So there was a point where Rome was actually abandoned, right? And I think they still had like masses, you know, in, in, in the basilica that, that Constantine had made in like a hundred, a thousand years before. There were still relics, but it, it was getting, there was pretty low maintenance, right? And then, so the, it was like 1300 or so, the French popes were living it up in France, in the south of France, right? In the French Riviera. And, and they were having a good time, actually. Um, but there was like this always thing that the Pope should be in Rome, because they're still the Bishop of Rome, even though they're living in France, right? It's like pretty bizarre. So they said, okay, well, eventually it's 1345, so I don't know, something in the mid-1300s, right? 
right around the, the the Black Death, right? So you had the Black Death going on, you had the Hundred Years' War going on, you had famines going on, you had sign and wonders in the sky going on. It was the end of the world, right? So we had to get the Pope back to Rome, right? The first Pope came back to Rome, right? He didn't last. He went back to France because he says it's too stinky in Rome. There's no, there's no infrastructure. And one day they they elected, they, they came back and says we got to be in Rome because Rome is where we're supposed to be. But they gonna so this time all the the the, the popes are elected by the cardinals, right? But they've been living in they've been living in Avignon in France, right? So all the cardinals are French too, right? They're all coming, to, so they're they're like trying to put up with being in Rome again. And, uh, but so, so they want to elect another like, French, French Pope, right? You get a lot of clout if, you know, your man's, you know, the, the Pope. But there was like a, a riot. All the Italians like surrounded the Vatican City and they were like throwing rocks and dead pigs. And they were, you know, so all these little French Popes who didn't even speak Italian, right? They were all like, scared so they go okay you you got your italian pope dude like it's 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 he's pope so they elect an italian pope but they didn't stay you know so but then the popes so all those cardinals went back to france and says well that pope's not real because he was he was elected under duress right you can't vote a pope under duress right you can't that's not fair right so really we're going to have a new conclave and we're going to convert a pope and we have a new pope and that's a French pope. So you have a, so you have a French pope and Italian pope because the Italian pope didn't go away. And then there was this whole thing where finally there was like three, what once I think they maxed out at four popes, you know, trapezing around Europe and, you know, their dresses saying, I'm the pope and no, you're the pope. And of course, when all this popery was going around, everybody was not paying attention to the basilica, which was getting older and older and older and older, right? So finally, someone said, there was this council that came along at one point who like excommunicated all the popes, right? You go, you're all done, right? And they says, we don't need a pope, what we need is a council, right? So all of the European countries got together and they had a council I and mean, there was a pope, but he was subjugated to the council, but that didn't work. Finally, because they, they were supposed to, this council was supposed to come back like every 10 years or something, but in the first, you know, decade later, they all came back, but the second decade, you know, there were things going on in their own country and they didn't come back. And pretty soon the Pope says, no, we don't need a council. So the council disappeared. So we're back to having one Pope. And finally, Nicholas, this Pope, was a pretty cool Pope as far as Popes go. He said, you know, we really need to get our popery in line you know, with Catholicism, we got to have to stop having the good life. I mean, he was maybe the initial Renaissance Pope. He, he wanted art, you know, he, he wanted a clean water system. He wanted a nice Rome, right, to be the center, you know, the the city on the hill to, to represent Christianity. So he went back to Rome, but, you know, it was a mess. There was no water system. Everybody was like shitting in the Tiber and drinking out of the same thing. So he had a lot of work to do. And he couldn't really start working on the basilica because Rome itself was such a mess, right? And once you get the Pope back, right, you have to have the Cardinals back and you have to have their, you know, the infrastructure, their, their bureaucracies, so all these people are coming back to Rome. So they have to start. So Nicholas actually got like the aqueducts working again, you know, I mean, that's one thing about Popes at this time, they were more like administrators or general contractors more than Popes because so much needed to be done, right? Just in a practical worldly sense. I mean, they had saints, but they were like saints off in the countryside. The Popes were the administrators of the church more than like you would think of a spiritual leader like the Dalai Lama or the Pope today, right? You think the Pope today is a pretty a more of a spiritual leader. Anyways, Nick, Nicholas got his dad. He's working and working and working, trying to get Rome livable, right? He couldn't even, it was so bad, he couldn't even live like in the Vatican, right? He had to move out because to the Lateran, he, he made like the the the, uh, the Lateran mansion or, you know, where he was going to live, you know, until they got, uh, you know, the, the Vatican back up again and working so he, but he did that he got it started and there was a few other popes after him and it got it got going where you know rope was rome was becoming a major city again right just so much money from all the tithes and all these catholics all over the freaking world had to pay tithe to the church but now they weren't going to france right i mean you could imagine when the popes were in france and the english had to pay 
money to the Pope in France when they're having a war with France. And that didn't go over well enough. Uh, and poor Italy was just a mess, right? It was, it was divided up into all these little kingdoms. Anyways, and there was another Pope called the, the Borgia who bought their way into the papacy because you could just buy your way into the papacy right now or bribe your way. Everything was up. It was called simony. You just, you know, put up some money because once you're in, you know, the curia, the, 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 the church structure, you could, um, uh, you know, you could, you could, you could buy, you know, you could buy the papacy or, or being a cardinal. And, and that's exactly what happened because it was a political, it was a political thing. And there were good popes and bad popes. Probably the Borgia were probably the worst popes, right? Probably the Borgia were more interesting of all the popes. Uh, there's a uh, Netflix or Amazon, I think it's Netflix, who, who does a whole, a whole series on the Borgia, if you want to know about the Borgia. Um, but after the Borgia, um, there was a pope called Julius, right? And well, there was one before him who, you know, after the Borgia, they decided to say, oh, no, we, 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 want, we want a strict, you know, a, a spiritual leader, right? And that didn't work out. They ended up killing him, and they brought um, Julius in, right? And Julius is the one we want to talk about, because Julius is, I mean, before I started reading and studying this recently, I thought Julius was, I, I like the Borgia better than I like Julius, because the Borgia were at least liberal, you know, they were like fun, they were, they were into the Renaissance. Um, you know, he openly, the Borgia, for example, openly lived with his, 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 his wife in the Vatican and they had like little kids running around the Vatican and uh, um, so, you know, there is, you know, which I think, I think that's a better image I would like to have the Pope be married with kids, little kids running around and stuff, but you know, and pets, you know, you should, Pope should be allowed to have pets. They can't have pets, for God's sake. Why would, what a stupid rule. Anyways, Julius comes along, and that's what we're going to start with. Julius is the one who's, who is, they call him the warrior Pope, right? Because he had no illusions about being a saintly person. He was the Pope with a sword. He was the last Pope that went at the head of an army, right, several times and victoriously, right? He, he led victorious armies first to take back the papal states that they had lost while the popes were in France, right? He had to get those back in line, right? And they just go, oh, the pope's here. We're going to go back and, you know, be, be with the pope. No, they were all going, no, well, you've been gone for like 100 years. Who the heck are you, right? We don't know who you are. And the pope says, well, no, these are the papal lands. You have to be, you know, pay homage to me just as you would to uh, a worldly lord, right? Um, so that was that. So he had to go into art, but we're going to talk about all that when we talk about Julius, right? But he was the one who says, you know, this this church of Constantine, it's like 13, you know, 100 years old by now, right? I mean, 1,300 years old, this church has been standing there. Basically, if you consider this is the beginning of the Renaissance, they've gone through the late Roman period, they've gone through the early Middle Ages, high Middle Ages, dark Middle Ages, you know, they went through the, all these, the, 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 you know, all these awful things are a black death, right? hundred years of war. The Muslims were coming in. Yeah? So it was a lot of bad things were going on. And Julius, you know, the last thing they needed from since now the church is a worldly power, right? The last thing they needed is a spiritual person trying to lead it. What they needed is a general contractor and and a warrior, right? On top of that, right? He, he was like, uh, you know, Patton and, and, and uh, I don't know who would be like Eisenhower all in the same person. He, he, he got things done and he was very detail oriented and he uh, he's the one like, who hired Michelangelo. He says, we're going to, we're going to tear down that stinky old church. First of all, it's the, the Basilica that Constantine wrote wasn't even safe anymore. The, the structural individual says it's, it's falling down. You're going to kill somebody. It's like leaning, you know, starting to lean on the side because the foundation hadn't been there. There's foundation wasn't you know set properly so it was like leaning right and all these saint bones and stuff are like creeping out when when it rains so julius unsentimental 
right? It says, no, tear, tear that, tear that puppy down and let's build a new one. And of course he didn't live to see, he didn't live to see it completed because it, it took like 150 years to see the Basilica as we see it today. And it took us from the Renaissance all the way to um, the Baroque and the Age of Reason and the Reformation uh, and the Counter-Reformation, all that stuff happened. And the, you know, the discovery of the new worlds, right? Like, you know, this is the Age of Reason was starting. So it's a terribly interesting part of history when this church was built, right? And so that's the story we're going to tell. And I hope you enjoy it. Thank you. Goofy Historians is the funnest place to learn about history. Or is it the funniest? Does history repeat itself? Eh, not really. But sometimes it kind of rhymes. <laughs>